Did you ever wake up in the morning and just know you were in a bad mood? Did you ever wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Now, today was one of those days for me. I, I woke up today on the wrong side of the bed. I woke up today and I just didn't feel like things were right. Every single little thing was bothering me and that's just kind of where I was. And I kind of resigned myself to the fact that that's the way that this day was gonna go because some days we just have days like that. We've gotta deal with it and that's understandable. But then something changed. And that something changed was is that I put myself in a different situation. I put myself in a different situation simply because the pattern of my life required me to be in that different situation. And that is, is that I came to church and today I did chapel with our preschool. And basically chapel with our preschool looks a lot like singing and dancing. And when you're singing and dancing with preschoolers, your perspective changes a great deal. And so uh, my perspective changed a great deal today, not because of anything that I did, but because of the situation that God placed me in and being open to that. And I share that with you as we go into this passage for today because of the fact that that's exactly the message that Paul wants us to grasp. Paul wants us to, to gain this understanding that God is going to be working in the midst of our lives even when we aren't working. God's going to be working in the midst of our lives even when we wake up on the wrong side of the bed. God's going to be working in the midst of our lives when we're not perfect. And thus, we can live our lives understanding every single day that we can live and have hope against all hope. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, this, this understanding of living a life with hope, even though our life is against all hope, even though things in our life are pointing us and teaching us that we should have no hope. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at. So we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 25. We're going to read down through these passages, and then we're going to go back and we're going to take things one at a time. So let's listen to the word of the Lord. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Thanks be to God for the reading of this word. As a point of review, we, we re, are reminded as we go into this passage that God's plan for salvation, as it says here, is faith, not good works or legalism. That you and I are not saved by what we do. We are saved because of who God is and our faith in that person, our faith in that God. And so when we start to grasp that, when we start to understand that, then we begin to see that our life is lived very differently. We begin to see that our life is lived in response. As opposed to trying to earn everything, we receive everything, and then we turn around and we live as people who have received. And this is the steady message that, that Paul has been given to the church in Rome and to us in the, in the chapters that have been preceding this one. And so just as a reminder as we go into this passage that that's exactly what we're going to be looking at. So when we look at verse 18, we go back to the beginning and we say, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. And this, this quote of so shall your offspring be is from Genesis 15, 5. When we take a look at this first verse, <clears throat> the thing that comes to mind is this concept of against all hope. It starts off with that against all hope. And that's what we were talking about at the beginning. I, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, but I kept moving because against all hope, I believe that I would overcome this. I believe that there was going to be a new way. And yes, God did that through my time with the preschool kids. Now, it might not be the same for you. Uh, God will do it in different ways. But the thing that we must understand is that there are going to be times in our life when we're going to be called to live against all hope. And in this passage specifically, Paul's talking about Abraham. So Abraham hoped in spite of no hope. Abraham hoped 
in the promise that God had given him, even though he was old. Abraham hoped in the promise that God had given them, even though he has not been able to have children up to this point in his life. And so he hoped against hope. Everything in the world would have told him at that point, You're, there's no hope. You have no hope. But the hope doesn't come from the world. The hope comes from our relationship, our faith in God. And so against all hope, Abraham believed. Against all hope, Abraham believed in spite of the fact that there was no hope. And that's what he's saying in this verse. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Let's look at verse 19 now. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And so when we look at this, this understanding in verse 19, it gives us a description of the no hope that the world would have presented to Abraham in response to the promise that God had given him, that Abraham was over 100 years old and that Sarah had been barren all of her life. And by the way, she's in her 90s. So Abraham's faith in God never weakened. And so this is the message that Paul is sharing with us. This is the message that Paul wants the church in Roman for us to understand, that his faith never weakened. Did Abraham weaken? I'm sure if we could go back in time, magically snap our fingers and be back in time with Abraham and live with him while he was going through this process, I'm sure there were times that he's doubted. I'm sure there are times that he got frustrated. I'm sure there are times when we have recorded in scripture, there are times that Abraham messed up. He made the wrong decisions. Well, this isn't talking about Abraham weakened. It talks about Abraham's faith in God never weakened. And it's very true that you and I can live in this both-and world, that we could have very strong faith in God and still mess up and still make bad decisions. Those two don't necessarily go hand in hand because we are human after all. And so we see here that the focus that Paul is, is taking us, the focus that Paul is taking the church in Rome to is saying it's not faith in Abraham, it's Abraham's faith in God, which is important. And again, that's the juxtaposition of the law and faith. A belief in the law being the thing that justifies you. The thing that the, believing that the law saves you is then putting your faith in yourself and your actions and what you can do. Believing that you're saved by grace through faith, that puts the, the focus on God. And so the faith is in God, not in yourself and your actions. And this is what Paul is saying to us. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Rome, that Abraham's faith in God never weakened. Abraham weakened, but his faith in God never weakened. Let's take a look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And so when we look at this verse, we understand that Abraham waited 25 years for God's promise to be fulfilled. Think about this for a second. I want you to take a, take a moment and think about where were you 25 years ago? Do you have that picture in your head? Can you see that person? Can you hear that person? 25 years ago was a very long time ago. Now, some may, may look at 25 years ago and can pull up a mental image of that person, remember, and it seems just like yesterday, but it really was 25 years ago. A lot can happen in 25 years. And we have to understand that this is a reality of this story. Sometimes when we read biblical stories, we lose this picture. We lose this understanding that between when God said or promised something and when the promise came fulfilled, many times is a long period of time. Here we have 25 years. Abraham waited 25 years for God's promise to be fulfilled. And I guarantee you during those 25 years, at some point he doubted. At some point he questioned. At some point he listened to those voices of the people in his life saying, are you sure you got this right? Are you sure you heard God right? And so over these 25 years, it's saying that his faith never weakened. He weakened, but his faith never weakened because he always came back to that place. Yes, it doesn't make sense, but I believe. And that is what was credited to Abraham as righteous. And that's what's credited to us as righteous. That against all hope, we still have hope because we understand that God doesn't always work on our timetable. God works on his own timetable. As we continue in this verse, we understand that having faith in God, not faith in the ways of this world. When we find ourselves in that place where we're questioning, when we find ourselves in that place where we're doubting, when we find ourselves in that place where we're wondering when this is going to happen or when we're going to experience something, 
the world is very good at creeping in and casting doubt. The world is very good at coming in saying, did you really hear it the way you heard it? Did you really understand it the way you understood it? Is it really true? But through this whole process, this 25 years that Abraham waited from the promise being given to the promise being fulfilled, he did not waver. He did not fall to the ways of the world. Why? Because Abraham's faith was in God not in the ways of the world. His faith was in his relationship with God. His faith was in the promise of God, not in his relationship with the world, not his promise, the promises of the world. His faith relationship was with God. His faith was in God. And so that faith didn't waver. He probably wavered, but his faith didn't waver. And that's very important for you and I as we look at our own lives. How many times have we wavered because we have put our faith in the ways of the world? We have put our faith in the things of this world as opposed to having our faith rest in God and standing firm there, knowing and understanding that the ways of the world will come against that, but we'll never let go of it. And that's where Abraham was. Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham didn't do everything right. But one of the things that Abraham did because time had proved it, Abraham kept his faith in God. He didn't have faith in the ways of the world. Let's look at verse 21. Verse 21 goes on and says, being fully persuaded. Oh, look at your translations. Does verse 21 start at the beginning of a sentence or in the middle of a sentence? Yeah, the translation I'm reading from NIV, it starts in the middle of the sentence. You might have a sentence that starts at the beginning and verse 21, your, your translators made that decision. Remember, there was no punctuation in the, in the original Greek, so the punctuation came later. This is the middle of a sentence according to the NIV, but they separated it off into another verse because they wanted this point to, to be hit home. They wanted this point to be able to stand on its own. So in verse 21, <clears throat> being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Let's say that again. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Again, this is the faith. This is the faith of Abraham we're talking about. Abraham believed that nothing is impossible with God. Abraham believed that nothing was impossible for God. That's the only stance that you can take as a hundred-year-old guy having a baby. You've got to believe that nothing is impossible with God. That's the only stance that you can take being a 90-year-old woman that has had a, a barren life, has never been able to produce children. It's the only stance you can take that you believe that with God all things are possible. And that's where Abraham was. Even though it took 25 years, even though he was an old man, he still believed that nothing was impossible with God. And that's very important. Listen to the, the verse again. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is so important that the early church just marked it off, made it its own verse so that we could focus on it. That we understand that nothing is impossible with God. We understand that faith in God is a response. We are faithful to God because God is faithful. And so this is, again, the point that Paul is trying to drive home. We do not do what we do in order to get something from God. God has given us everything, thus we do what we do in response to what we've already received. And this is so important. As Paul moves off past chapter 4 into deeper teachings of the faith, he needs all of his audience to understand. He needs us to understand that we all find ourselves in the same place. We are all sinners saved by grace. We, we are not good enough. We can never be good enough to, to warrant God's righteousness on our own. Thus, we must claim and believe the faith. We must claim and believe in the gift of Jesus Christ. We must claim and believe that we are saved. And so then we live our lives in response to that. We don't do what we do in order to earn. We have been given. Thus, we do what we do in response. And that's so important that you know, faith in God is, our faith in God is a response. It's not something we do to earn. It's, it's not um, a, a grade on a paper. It's not a star on an attendance chart. It's what we do in response. God has already done everything. Now we live in our lives in response to what God has done. Let's look at verse 22. Verse 22 goes on and says, This is why, this is why, meaning living our lives in response to the gifts of God, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So when we look at first, verse 22, we're reminded of, of Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6 teaches us that Abraham did some good things and he made some mistakes. Abraham 15, 6 is where it was credited to him as righteousness. But if you watch the rest of the story, if you read the rest of the story, if you listen to the rest of the story, you understand that Abraham made some bad decisions. Abraham did some things that were head scratchers, just like you and me. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, but yet we will still do dumb things. We will still make mistakes. We will do things that cause people to scratch their heads around us. And so we have to understand, if I'm going to claim that my salvation is not through what I do, it's through what I believe, then I have to understand that what I do is not impacting that salvation. 
that what I do is not the thing that is, is keeping that salvation in check, that thing that's not keeping the salvation fresh or, or alive in my life. The things that I do are merely things that I do in response to what I've already received. And sometimes I'm going to do the wrong things. So when I do the wrong things, it gives me the ability to step back and say, whoa, okay, nothing is going to interfere with my salvation. I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus, but I just did something wrong, so I need to make that right. I need to get right with it. If, on the other hand, you believe that you're saved by what you do, you will always deny the wrong things that you do because you believe if you admit that you did something wrong, then you are also saying, I've lost my salvation. You're also saying that I, I've lost that relationship. I've lost that connection with God. And that's just not true. We don't lose the connection with God because we do something bad. We get separated, but then because of the fact that we understand and we know that our salvation is by grace through faith, we have the ability, we have the courage to turn around and say, I messed up. I messed up, and so I need to reconnect with you. I messed up, so I need to make amends for this. But if you believe that your actions get you saved, then you're always going to deny your wrong actions because you want to keep your salvation. You understand what I'm saying? And this is what Paul is saying here in verse 22 as he says again, This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. This is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness because it takes off the table the pressure of doing everything right. It takes off, the, takes off the table the pressure of being perfect all the time because we can't do it. We can't be right all the time. We can't be perfect all the time. Well, what we can be is real. And so in our realness, we embrace the grace, but yet we turn around and we live in response. Thus, we have the courage and the ability to fess up to our mess ups. And God meets us right there and we've already been forgiven and we get to move forward. We don't have to hide it anymore. We can get real with God, and that's what he's talking about in this verse. Let's go ahead and look at verse 23. So we keep going down to verse 23. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone. The words it was credited to him were not written for him alone. It would be very easy for us to say, well, that was the deal that Abraham and God had. That God and Abraham had this relationship, and Abraham believed, and God credited to him as righteousness. But that's a special thing. That's just him and Abraham. Does that make sense to you? That argument makes sense to us because of the fact that that's who we are as sin-stained human beings. When Paul is trying to help us to understand that the saved by grace through faith, the faith that was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness, is the same faith for you and for me. That Abraham isn't the only one in human history who can be righteous in God's eyes by faith. He's not the only one. Yes, you can make that argument. And yes, you can say, well, that was a special relationship. That was, that was Abraham and God. Uh, my relationship with God is different. I'm not Abraham. Well, again, we have to understand the nature of God. We have to understand that when we read about um, God in the Bible, when we read the stories about God's people in the Bible, um, the pur one of the purposes of it is to reveal his nature to us, to reveal who God is. Well, one of the things that we see in the story of Abraham is that God used a specific group of people to be the example for the rest of us. Now, the problem is, is that specific group of people over time came to believe that they were a specific group of people because they were all that in a bag of chips and they were special and nobody else counted. That wasn't God's intention. Us sin-stained human beings, we did that. It was important for us to have a group of people, the nation of Israel, it was important for us to have them as an example. Four, think about your own life. You can hear about a restaurant or you can hear about some service or business you can see an ad for it on TV, um, you can read about it in the paper, you can see something on the internet, but it's not until someone you know comes to you and gives you a positive review of that restaurant or that service or that product that you will then begin to, to consider using it. You might even get up and go and use it because so-and-so told you it was good. And the difference is, is the personal relationship. It is another person, just like you, who experienced something and they received a benefit and now they're sharing the benefit with you. Okay, you understand that? Now take that very understanding and put it to the relationship with humanity to God. God couldn't just spread the heavens and stick his head down into our reality and say, You are saved! I am Lord God Almighty and everything is forgiven. People wouldn't have bought it. People wouldn't have believed it. 
Uh, we see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus lived for 33 years and we crucified him. We killed him. So we have to understand that the way that God is going to communicate with us, because God knows us, is that he needed to select a group of people, some of us, who could live in their relationship with God and then share their experience. And because of their experience, we would come to a faith. Because of their experiences, we would come to a relationship with God. That's why the nation of Israel was, was created. That's why God made his promise to Abraham. Because the only way we were ever going to believe or ever going to establish a relationship with God is to follow the lead of someone else who had already done it. Because that's who we are as sin-stained human beings. Does that make sense to you? I hope. Because it's important for you to grasp that concept as we move forward, not only in Romans, but also in our life. That God did what he did because of who we are. God didn't do what he did because he had to do it that way. God did what he did because that was the best way to connect with us. Let's go ahead and look at verse 24. Verse 24. <clears throat> but also for us. Oh, look at your translations. Does it start in the middle of a sentence again? Yeah. And what's the first word? But. Pay attention to the buts in the Bible. <clears throat> but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So the verse before is saying the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, not for Abraham alone, which leads us to ask the question, well, well then who was it written for? But also for us, for you and me, to whom God will credit righteousness. You and me that God will credit righteousness. Well, what do we have to do in order for God to credit righteousness to us? For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So when we look at this verse, we understand that the same thing is true for us. When we believe in God, who raised Jesus from the dead. So Abraham is not unusual. <clears throat> Abraham is not an anomaly. Abraham is not something uh, in a relationship with God that only he has. It's a relationship that God is using as an example for our possibility of relationship. Israel and their relationship with God has been used by God as a possibility for our relationship with God. It was the human example. It was the person that tells you that the restaurant is really good and it's worth the time. It's worth the money. <clears throat> that's the, that's the, the, the placement of Abraham and that's the understanding of Israel. And so when we look at this, we understand that what we read in Genesis between Abraham and God is not just for Abraham. It's for all of us. Abraham just is the example for us. And so we all get to experience what Abraham experienced because of faith. And that's very important. Also, too, when we look at this verse, we'll understand that we don't just believe in the resurrection, but that God is the one who raised Jesus up. And it's important. Listen to these, these words again. But also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So there would be no confusion with the Gentiles, no confusion with the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians or the Jewish Christians. Jesus is God incarnate. And so God sent Jesus into the world to become one of us, to die for us on the cross so that we could be saved. And God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. For Jesus was fully human, but also fully divine. So we don't lose the connection with God. The, the Jewish Christians don't have to lose their connection with God simply because their faith in Jesus. Their faith in Jesus brings them to God. Their faith in Jesus is the thing that connects them to God like the law could never. The thing that connects them to God like circumcision could never. And it's important for the Gentiles because the Gentiles might be a little confused. I don't know if you've ever been confused over this. Do, do I worship Jesus or do I worship God? Are they the same or are they different? All those questions are, are out there. Well, Paul starts to address that, and he's going to address it more later in the letter of Romans. But he starts to address it now by saying that we are righteous just like Abraham is righteous. Abraham believed the promise of God, and it was credited to him as righteous. You and I believe in the promise of God and is credited to us to the righteous. But our promise is not to have children. Our promise is Jesus. Our promise is the resurrection. Our promise is salvation through Jesus. And that's the peace that gives us that connection to Abraham. That's the peace that brings us to that place where we can declare that we are saved by grace through faith. Just like Abraham was saved by grace through faith. We both believed in the promise. 
The promise was just a little different. Abraham's promise is that he would be the father of many nations. Our promise is, is that Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day to save us from our sins. And that God has done it. God did it in Abraham's time, and God did it in Jesus' time. Oh, and by the way, God's doing it today. Let's continue, and let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 goes on. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Here's a theological perspective here. This is something that we're going to get a steady diet of in Romans, and that is that Paul is giving us a theological foundation for our faith. He is giving us the perspectives that we need to hold on to as we journey through this life and wrestle with the things of this world and the things of faith. And this is one of the pieces that he gives us as a foundation. Jesus was delivered. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That Jesus suffered and died in our place. Jesus didn't do what he did for himself. Jesus did what he did for us. God did not need to save us through Jesus. We needed Jesus in order to be saved. And that's so vital, and that's a theological underpinning. That's a foundational block to your understanding and your faith in Jesus, is that Jesus didn't do all of this for him. Jesus did what he did for us. Because if you remember, you go all the way back into Genesis, and you have the story of Adam and Eve who encountered this serpent, and the serpent basically asked a whole bunch of questions and put some doubt in their minds about whether or not they should eat this tree, of the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he placed this seed of doubt in their minds, and they went ahead and they tried it because they wanted the knowledge of good and evil. And so they sinned. They, they separated themselves from God by being disobedient. Well, when God came and met them and they had their conversation about what had just happened, God said, because you have done this, you now shall surely die. Death is the price to be paid for separation. We separate ourselves from God through sin. We die. And so this death is the piece, this is basically in essence the, the credit card bill that you get at the end of the month that has to be paid. Well, guess what? If there would have been the ability for some human being to pay the price for us, to die in, in place of us, then there would have been a human being. Some gallant man or gallant woman in the past would have volunteered and said, I'll pay the price for all of humanity and it would have been taken care of. The problem is, is that any human being that would make that sacrifice, any human being that would make that offer, would be sin-stained. Because remember, we can't be good enough on our own. So thus, their death could not have been substitutionary for us, because they were just as bad as we are. Only through the perfect could we be saved. And so Jesus, without any sin, gave his life, voluntarily gave his life for us on the cross so that we could be saved. Not because he needed to do it but because we needed him to do it for him, us. And so we see this concept over and over and over again in our relationship with God. God is doing what he does because that's the way we need it. Not the way that God has to do it, but the way that we need it. He meets us where we are. God is constantly meeting us where we are. And that is something that we need to praise and we need to say hallelujah for. Because many times we're running away from God, but God continues to meet us even in the midst of our running. As we move on in verse 25, we also see here it is only through Jesus that we can be justified or made right with God. How was Abraham made right with God? Abraham was justified by God because he believed in the promise of God. Well, guess what? Jesus is a promise not just for Abraham, but a promise for all of the world. And we need to believe, just as Abraham did, in that promise in order for us to be justified. So that's why Abraham is our spiritual father, because we follow his lead. He was justified because he believed the promise of God. We are justified because we believe the promise of Jesus. We believe in what he did. We believe in the death and the resurrection. And so we are justified, just like Abraham was, through believing, through faith. And our faith is in Jesus. And that through Jesus, it's the only way we'll ever be made right with God. Last but not least on this, we see that it is our faith in the good news of Jesus that allows us to be counted as righteous, just like Abraham. It's our faith in the good news. It's not faith in the law. It's not the faith in the church. It's not the faith in how good we could be. It's faith in Jesus that brings us to that place of justification. And that's good news. That's good news because it takes the pressure off of you and me. 
if you and I had to be justified by, in, in God's eyes by our behaviors, by what we do, then guess what? We're doomed. We're going to blow it every single time. And that's just going to bring stress into our lives. We're just, going to, we're just going to be a bundle of stress and anxiety because we are constantly going to live under the pressure of being able to do something we can't do. But because of the good news of Jesus, because of what Jesus has offered us through the death and the resurrection on the cross, then we see the ability for us to be justified through faith. Thus, whew, we can wipe away the concern. We can wipe away the worry about being good enough. And we can just start living into a person who is saved. And that means that we're going to mess up. But when we mess up, we don't have a fear of fessing up because of the fact that we know our salvation is not based on what we do. Our salvation is based on our faith in Jesus. Our salvation is based on our faith in what God has promised. And so when our faith is in that, then we can have the courage to turn around and say, guess what? I just messed up there. I need help. And not have to worry that we're losing something, that we're blowing something, because it's not all up to us. It's up to God. And that is good news. Good news today, good news tomorrow, good news forever. Now that's where we're going to end up today. We're going to start chapter 5 next week. And I encourage you to invite somebody to join with you in this study, whether they can physically be with you or they're just going to make, uh, you can just share the link with them. If there's been a blessing here for you, I pray that you share it with somebody else so it can be a blessing for them. That's why the word is shared. That's why we do Bible study, so that we can be blessed, we can be built up, we can be strengthened. So until we get back together again, I pray that you stay safe and I pray that you stay sane.